Well, here with me in Westminster now are the uh, former UKIP leader, Nigel Farage, still, of course, a member of the European Parliament, and uh, Kenneth Clark MP, uh, the veteran uh, Europhile Conservative MP and former Cabinet Minister, held just about every top job there except Prime Minister, I think. I've uh, been around a bit, yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, Nigel Farage, how much responsibility, uh, uh, I mean, blame or credit, do you think you deserve personally for the fact that Britain two years ago voted to leave the European Union? Well, I don't think there would have been a referendum if I hadn't done what I'd done. Uh, you know, I was taking a lot of votes off the Conservative Party to begin with. Later on, actually, I was taking more Labour votes, but it was the effect, psychologically, I think, I was having on David Cameron that made him concede to say there would be a referendum. Interestingly, when Cameron did that, uh, he thought the UKIP fox would be shot, and actually, all it did in a way was legitimise the position uh, that we've been putting out there. So, yeah, in terms of the referendum happening, I think, I think that was a UKIP success. Um, and, of course, I was thrilled two years ago that we won, despite having the whole world against us. I, I have to say, with the anniversary coming up tomorrow of that referendum, uh, I feel pretty bitterly disappointed at the way this government's okay, happening. Okay, well, I mean, do you accept that it's his fault? Uh, actually, to start, I, I agree with practically everything he said. I, 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 agree I several times publicly acknowledged that Nigel, in a way, is one of the most successful political people of my lifetime because he made it absolutely, he produced a transformative change uh, in this, you know, the whole relationship of the country with the rest of the world. We're waiting to discover uh, where we're going. And it was very much down to UKIP. He, he brought immigration into the argument, which strengthened the a previously uh, Eurosceptic cause. Uh, and he took great advantage of the referendum. I don't take away from him his quite extraordinary triumph. I do disagree uh, with uh, the, the fact that it was just UKIP caused Cameron to call the referendum. He was more bothered, Cameron, David Cameron was more bothered about party management. Oh. He wanted to shut up uh, backbench well, Brexiteers before well, the election. Well, Ken, he, he, thought, partly. he thought what was going to happen was a flood of defections from Conservative backbenchers to UKIP, and that was the biggest fear that he well, had. We, 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 and we'll there was some that. justification in that. We'll leave that for later, because uh, uh, I, I had a long row with him, and it wasn't the explanation he gave me. Been but I also share could, the could disappointment. Been, a year could, on, we're getting yeah. nowhere. Uh, and when the government can agree a policy, when the cabinet has a policy for what it wants to do now, uh, we may, we'll, we'll be clear about what's going to happen. But it, we're making, it, it is disappointing that two years after the referendum, mm. we really have made little progress at all. And the present situation is getting very worrying. We're just a few months to go before we uh, leave the biggest free trade area in the world. I mean, I suspect you're disappointed for different reasons. Uh, I think for mirror image reasons. Right. Uh, I, mean, yeah, yeah, I think I'd agree with that. I so let's take Airbus, for example. Is yep. that the sort of thing that's worrying that's you? That's symptomatic. I mean, <laughs> most, both, sides, both sides have a habit of leaping on one example. So somebody will announce the investment tomorrow and Brexiteers will say this shows what a triumph it all is. That you can't leave the biggest and richest international free trade agreement in the world without damaging your economy. There are lots of other things as well. And manufacturing, international manufacturing, is obviously vulnerable. I mean, everybody starts arguing about in general terms, I don't see how you can deny that if you're making the wings in Bristol and then sending them over to, to France, you know, lots of other parts, it's true of cars as well. All the bits of it flow backwards and forwards over an open border, tariff-free with no customs procedures, if you don't keep that, then you'll get, it must be it's just simple. You're worse off than you were, and the future of those manufacturing industries is damaged. All kinds of other areas of economy. Except as that, well. I mean, you're responsible for damaging, <laughs> damaging do you know, the Airbus. Do you know, 20 years ago, I heard car manufacturers saying if Britain didn't join the Euro, they may well consider pulling out of Britain. I don't remember They're that. still here. Oh, yes, Nissan, others no. like that. I didn't read that. So, but that's not, big, I mean, big this is a reality, though, today. Big businesses, this is not a hypothetical look, scare. we build the wings in this country. How if they close down production, it would take them at least two years to put that back in place somewhere in France or Germany. Big businesses will always lobby for their interests. Of course they will. I understand that. But what business wants above all, where I will agree with Airbus, is what business wants, they want to know what the cards are they've got to play with. Yeah. And, and one of my objections to the transition period is all that does is delay the uncertainty as to where we're going to finish up. 
They, they, they want a transition period, and because before, I mean, well, if, well, if, well, they want if, a permanent if, one. If, if you haven't settled <laughs> what the changes are, they don't want to right. just leave with no, nobody having a clue uh, what, what what happens next. I, I don't know how, Nigel, you explain that a business like Airbus or a business like Nissan is not damaged if you just start introducing delays at the ports, new paperwork, new tariffs, uh, start saying you're going to have different regulations. The idea that that will not affect the smooth flow of components and vehicles okay. yes, making but, a car, but, but Ken, and it's just but, not but rational. Ken, that is 10% of the UK economy. 10% oh, well, 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 of our economy. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and you've got to think about the rest. And also, bear this in mind, only 15% of global GDP well, is the Eurozone. There's a great big world out yeah. there. Let's engage with well, it. 10% of the, of the British economy is quite a lot of the British economy. Yes, it is. But Brexit, but why would you, but, for 10% of your economy, bind the other 90% with well, European rules? I just want the to, point about Brexit is we want to become no, competitive. But I just want to put this point to you, because as I understand it, one of your differences with some of the Conservative Brexiteers is you actually think if there is an economic hit in the short term, it's worth it. Well, I don't think there has to be, but let's remember But you what, do think it'd be worth it if there was. The referendum wasn't about economics. The referendum was about, do we want to govern our own country, yes or no? And we chose to govern our own country. That is the fork in the road this government has been told to follow, and at the moment they're not doing it, and they're basically listening too much to big businesses lobbying on their own behalf. Uh, I, I'm agreeing, and this must worry yeah. you, uh, resenting yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> two hearts. The, it, it, the, the referendum was not about economics at all. Yeah. It wasn't mentioned. Uh, that absolutely nobody voted to leave the single market in the customs union because it, it didn't feature in the yeah. debate. Well, oh, well, it was it invented no, no, afterwards. No, it did. No, it, it was did. It, yeah, no, it, it, every was, major player no, said, it, if we vote to leave, we leave the so single market. But, no, no, but if, for example, if, for example, as is being mooted this week, we were to agree uh, to a single market on goods and in exchange to have some idea of freedom of movement within the European Union, perhaps for workers. Would that be acceptable to the you? A total sellout. Total sellout. We voted to take back control of our borders but would, and we voted... But wouldn't that be having voted, the best of both worlds? No, I, I think actually the worst of both worlds in many ways because we, we, we'd find ourselves still with 100% of our economy bound by European rules unable to reach out into the rest of the world and make our own fresh trade deals. No, that is, we, it's clear, we voted, let's put this word out there, we voted for independence, let's take it. Some of the hardline Tories, I'm uh, disagreeing with in the House of Commons, are, are as far, have the same religious fervour that we're leaving everything to do with Europe. Yeah. So that means that mm. we, you know, it doesn't matter about 10% of the economy only being manufacturing and all that kind of thing, just pulling out. That, 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 and it, it, it is rather worrying. I, don't, I just don't yeah. understand what drives this thing. If it's got the word Europe in it, and, and then. We want to be our own, can, we want to govern our own country. We want to be an independent people. We don't want Mr. Juncker yeah. governing us. Uh, most and a bunch of old, a bunch of old losers in Brussels. Most we Brexite want to be free. Most Brexiteers cannot think of a regulation they want to change. If you ask people to right. cite one, usually yeah. they Common cite Fisheries one that policy, is in the European Common Union. Agricultural policy, uh, uh, working uh, uh, time directive. Uh, uh, I could go on. Only one device I, I could go on. Of course, of course. Of course. Of course. Mr. There. Clark, you did accept that uh, <laughs> one of the powerful <laughs> arguments that uh, Nigel Farage introduced into the Brexit thing was the question of immigration. Yes. And uh, there is, is there not, a widespread public desire to yeah. reduce the level of immigration? Well, there is, and it's been whipped up very much. And, and uh, one thing I totally agree is I think you'd reassure people, because we're not really racialist and xenophobic in this country, only a minority of people. But, I mean, the you feeling, we, is, the feeling we've lost control is well, it's, it's us better. I agree with that. And people mm -hmm. just think somehow we, we should control it better. Uh, we could tighten up on Europeans, but we've already discovered that we actually need... Poles coming here to do skilled jobs that we haven't got, or Romanians coming here as nurses, or people coming here to pick crops. I mean, we're going to have to make endless exceptions and you just stop people. People don't come here just for benefit, but you make it clear you're going to stop that. The real problem is immigration from outside, which I think we should be liberal about. I'm in favour of asylum. I don't have any slightest hang-up about anybody's ethnicity myself, but I think in the campaign, people were, it was Muslims people were worried about. It was the people on the beaches of Libya. They somehow thought Jean Claude Juncker was sending them here and they didn't want them to come here. We've got enough already, that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, now, I don't agree with any of that. 
but I do think the total lack of control we have mm -hmm. over illegal immigration, which is flowing in on lorries and jeeps all the time from around the world, uh, and our failure with other Europeans to actually mm -hmm. respond to the sudden surge from Africa and the Middle East in any effective way and also civilized and humanitarian way, I would hope, uh, that is a big issue. It's causing half the problems in Western democracies all over the place. It's Mexicans in America, it's yeah. Arabs well, in France, immigration yeah. here, nothing actually to do with our membership of the European Union. I mean, conversely, Nigel Farage, is that why you're disappointed that we haven't, haven't closed borders to the extent... No wonder she needs another 20 billion for the National Health Service. Our population is now rising by half a million people every single year, and three quarters of that is directly down to immigration. What was announced yesterday was that complete free movement from the European Union will go on for a further three years without a single promise as to any checks being put in place after that. And, and frankly, quite how the Conservative Party get away with fighting the last three yeah. elections on manifestos, yeah. promising to right. reduce to tens of thousands a year oh, well, without silly, ever yeah. meaning it, right. I think it's disgraceful. Do you believe there is a Brexit dividend that could fund the National Health Service? Uh, well, there could be, but not if, you get, not if you stay in a transition period where effectively you go on paying in 10 billion a year. At the moment, you know, this 20 billion yeah. she's talking about now, it's not a Brexit dividend because we, we, we won't actually have left. Kenneth Clark, do you believe there's a Brexit dividend? Complete nonsense. Uh, she, every now and then, unfortunately, my unfortunate Prime Minister, you know, I have every sympathy with Theresa. She has to. She, well, she it's very she, studio, she, you called her a bloody difficult it, woman. She's a bloody difficult She needs to be more difficult with some of her colleagues <laughs> in the cabinet, I think. Uh, but, but she. she, she she, she, she can't get anybody in the cabinet to agree on a policy. She gets them to agree on something and they all start going back at it afterwards and saying it's crazy and all that kind of thing. Uh, and every now and again she makes a gesture to one side or the other. Sometimes a gesture to my side, sometimes a gesture to Boris or whoever it is. Uh, and to claim, when it's a very good announcement about money for the NHS as announced, and to start persuade, explaining to the public that taxation is going to have to go up to pay for it. So it's a, it's a desirable policy, it will require selling. She decided to give a cheering up sop uh, to Boris with his memories of his boss and things, so claimed that a Brexit dividend was going to contribute to it. Again, I agree with Nigel. Oh the, at the moment, the Brexit dividend yeah. is, is a complete is political mythology. You know mythology. the in the bus, did you? That was the different campaign. No, I, I, thought, no I, I thought the mistake was to use the gross figure. I thought they should have used the net figure and there would have been less of an argument about it. But look, the fact is, we've agreed to pay another 40 billion sterling to the European Union as part of our leaving terms. And the real point here, Ken, you know, you, you make the point that she sort of gives a sop to one side or the other. What the country is crying out for is leadership. 70% of people in opinion polls, including a third of those that voted Remain, the message to the government is, will you please just get on with it? And yeah, but the details are not understood by the public. And hundreds of questions, I mean, all kinds of things we haven't touched on yet, we haven't even started yeah. on, are going to have to be settled. And the other thing not forget is we have based our political position in the world on being a leading member of the EU that was close to America as well, that's all collapsing, and our whole economy has been based on free trade, trade agreements with the Europeans, and through the EU, trade agreements with lots of countries around the world. We, uh, and, and too few. We must not, for playing around because of you know, fervor about foreigners and European things, actually start damaging that for future generations. And of course, months after the referendum came the American election and the election of uh, President Trump, who described himself at times as Mr. Brexit. You were the <laughs> first politician to see him subsequently. He's coming to the UK soon. Uh, are either of you expecting to see him, to talk to him? Well, I hope so, but it's going to be a very difficult trip, isn't it? Um, the European Union this week announced that the European Investment Bank will start lending to Iranian companies again. We've got a NATO summit, which promises to be confrontational. Yeah. Um, it's not going to be an easy visit. What would you say to him? Or will you meet him? I, don't, I very much doubt whether I shall meet him. I'm sure he'll meet Nigel. Nigel's an old friend of his. Uh, and I think the two of them admire each other's spectacular populist campaigning. I mean, they, they rank with the best in the Western world for sweeping, ordinary, my opinion, 
common sensible uh, politics of government to one side and putting protest uh, uh, anti-establishment stuff at the head of things. Uh, if you're, you know, you meet Boris probably as well. Boris has a lot. He's obviously an admirer of Donald Trump. But it's Trump. funny, Ken. It's happening has, in Italy. Has, it's has happening a, in Hungary. I, I, I know, it's I mean, sweeping the whole of the Western world. It's a very, we want the we'll nation some states. Other time. I think it's a serious problem. You actually have used it brilliantly but, but, to get the but, British into the present Ken, situation. Do you not see? The do you not see that right across the Western world, what voters are saying I do, I is they want the nation state to be the essential building block no, through no. which they make their decisions. That that is why there's a new Italian government. It's as simple as that. No, it's a, it's the it's the, but the, what it's the people that what it's based on is the people who feel they've not shared in this great new prosperity that the establishment the politicians are all comfortable, you know. I was chancellor in the great normality of the 1990s, and they say, you know, here in my Rust Belt city, uh, I'm not sharing in all this. I'm probably worse off than I was 10 years ago. Dead worried about the prospects for my kids. All these people in London, all these people in Washington, they don't know what they're talking about. I see pictures of rich businessmen fooling about on their yachts, and I, I hate the lot of them. And, and uh, they, 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 so we have, a, we have a, what should a politician do about it? I think people like me who believe in liberal economics with a social conscience have got to go back to the drawing board and ask ourselves why did we not see this coming? What can we do that gets the broader population? on board feel they belong, they're benefiting to, their futures are secure. But this is sadly, global, this I, is Ken. sadly I think the EU is part of that, but in America they had Trump, in Italy they've just thrown all their partisans out and have a lot of clowns. But the European Union uh, has got, given uh, us uh, here it was can, Brexit. can the European Brexit. Union has given us a form of global corporatism which does actually and, play yeah. into the hands of the big giant multinational businesses, a handful of big banks and actually, we're not even living in a free market capitalist system that you were part of with Mrs. Thatcher all those years ago. We're living in global corporatism. The big guys win, the small guys lose. And breaking up structures like the European Union is the opportunity, to, for me, I believe, to help ordinary people. When I was in the Thatcher government, we were taking the lead on one thing in Europe, the creation of the single market. You, you sound as though you're hostile she to the that. modern globalised economy. It, it is difficult. It is complicated, it's rules-based nowadays, and it's only by sensible free trade and rules agreements with other people that you prosper. I won't go into the politics as well, it's a small world politically. Where there's a Cold War breaking out with Putin, we have violence all over right. our borders, uh, the immigration crisis is uprooting all our politics. You can't just opt out and say it's simple, it's all Brussels, it's all those bureaucrats' yeah. fault. We're going back to a distant, simple world where we didn't I think, have I think, I think with you two, I think with you two, no one is going to have the last word. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to leave it open. Do come back again. Thank you very much indeed.